Good morning, and you're all very welcome to this AIB Business Leaders Live event where we're going to talk about the role of sustainability for SMEs. Sustainability is a word we've been hearing a lot about for quite a few years now. It has tended to be very much in the realm of big corporations having sustainability policies, governments talking about sustainability policies, but very much the focus, I think, for today is on SMEs and what the potential and the opportunities and the avenues are towards building a sustainability policy for an SME and what you can do in that regard. We've got a fantastic lineup of speakers and I'm going to introduce you uh, to all of them very shortly and I'll talk you through how this morning session will play, when we'll have breaks, when we'll have panel discussions and all of that uh, very shortly. But in the meantime, I'm delighted to welcome Cathy Bryce, Managing Director, Corporate Institutional and Business Banking at AIB, to formally welcome you and tell us a bit about uh, what's happening with AIB from a sustainability point of view. Cathy. Thanks, Richard, and uh, welcome, everybody, and, and thanks for taking the time to join us this morning. Um, from an AIB perspective, sustainability has actually been one of our strategic pillars now for the last two and a half years, so one of our five strategic pillars. So we've really tried to dedicate ourselves to improving in this whole area of sustainability. And we've done that across a couple of strands. First of all, in relation to our, our own operations and how uh, environmentally friendly they can be and energy efficient. Uh, we're also working with our suppliers and trying to help them come on a journey with us also in relation to sustainability of their own operations. And of course, we're looking at our own products and uh, increasingly our aim is for our new lending to be aimed at sustainable uh, investment. And in 2020, 16% of our new lending uh, met that qualification. But I think standing back for us, we probably feel that the most impact we can make is the support we give to you, our SME customers and our broader customer base in, in helping you on this journey. You know, our aim is to be a key strategic partner for you. And for all of us looking forward five or 10 years, it's really hard to see how sustainability won't be a key strategic item for all of us in running businesses today. So it's really in that context that I think that we're, we're here today. Um, we recognize that this is not easy. Uh, this is a hard journey. It requires a lot of commitment, a lot of effort, and it is costly as well. Uh, Richard has spoken about you know, how big business has maybe been on this uh, train, uh, so to speak, for, for a number of years. And I think for smaller SMEs, Maybe the question is, you know, can this be something for, for government to lead out on? Does it have to be ourselves? But I, I think the more we, we hear about this subject, the more we realize that, you know, our customers, your customers are increasingly looking for this, maybe demanding this, uh, and your broader stakeholders, your local communities and, and society at large are really looking for all of us to join in this journey. Um, uh, we talk about challenges, but I think there are also great opportunities. I, I really look forward to some of the AIB customers this morning talking to us about some of those opportunities. And I look forward to Gorn talking to us about mindset uh, and how we really try and equip ourselves. So with that said, I'm going to pass back to Richard and, and look forward to a really good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Cathy. Well, we, the morning is made up of three sessions. We're about to kick off the first session shortly, and Cathy Bryce will be staying with us for that. And it's uh, on why sustainability, the long-term impact versus short-term gain. After that uh, session, and in that one, we'll hear from our keynote speaker very shortly. We'll be joined by uh, a number of businesses AIB customers, small businesses, consultants, uh, to talk about what they have done in relation to sustainability. And then we'll have a third session as well, where we'll have another panel discussion on other aspects of sustainability that will deal with business and consumer trends. Uh, we'll also be hearing from uh, AIB as well, Catherine Moroni at AIB, about uh, the bank's uh, participation in what they're hearing and seeing in relation to consumer trends and business trends around sustainability. So I'm looking forward to uh, all of that. There will be a five minute break at the end of each session. So you can grab that cup of tea or coffee or whatever you need to do. And there will be opportunities for you to ask questions. So please do submit questions. You'll see that you can do that on the right hand side of your screen. We'll also have a few opinion polls as well. So please do participate in those and everyone will get the most out of uh, this morning's event. So I'm delighted to uh, welcome uh, our keynote speaker in, in the first session, Goran Karstedt. Uh, Goran is a sustainability leader and social entrepreneur 
he has held senior corporate executive positions in Volvo, in IKEA, and he's also heavily involved in the Clinton Climate Initiative. Uh, so will you please welcome Goran Karstadt. Thank you very much, Richard, and good morning to all of you. Um, I hope we are, you can hear me. I'm invited to share reflections on how we can create a sustainable future, the leadership challenge of our time. And um, I'm not comfortable in trying to stand in front of you to tell you what you should do, but when I can share what I learned myself, it's more meaningful. And as a matter of fact, I'm as, I am a small business person. I'm coming from a family business background, but uh, then I worked uh, in Volvo and Ikea for 16 years and seven years. And, and after that, be very much into the sustainability journey. Um, and uh, I've been leading organizations in Sweden, in France, in America, in China, very different leadership cultures. And I've also been invited, as I said, to, to lead in Volvo and Ikea. Uh, and here you have two corporate cultures that are completely different. I would say it's opposites. So the cultural settings has been very different when I've been in leading positions. But my key question is, is it anything we can see in common here? And I think it is. Because in all the missions we are on, you as well as I have been, we are expected to deliver some results. Selling more products maybe, or making more money or implementing a new strategy. And in order to make that happen, we need the organization to deliver on the expectations. And in order to do that, we have to create human energy. And then it starts to be interesting, according to me. Because in my experience, we create that human energy by inviting people to something that is meaningful to something that is uh, purposeful. When we invite people to something worthy, their full commitment, when people say, wow, I'm in, I like to be part of this. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, whatever we do, I think it has to be relevant to our times. We have to be part of the world outside, so it makes sense. And secondly, in order to organize ourselves, we have to invite people to co-create. You know, we have to invite the commitment, the, the uh, ingenuity and innovation from the organization. And thirdly, we have to take an outside in perspective and not, not only inside, a bottom up and not just the top down. And if you think like that, really the organizing principle is not so much what is good for a company, but what is our company good for? And some see this as playing around with words, but for me, these are two different landscapes. And it's really organ leads us to the question, how do we create innovation and learning? Uh, and one of the interesting uh, uh, statements in the IKEA corporate Bible says, only while sleeping, we make no mistakes. And the fear of making mistake is the root of bureaucracy and the enemy of all evolution. I think that's a wonderful statement because IKEA is an example of a world-class company. And it has really come through letting loose an, an innovative and learning experience because a learning organization is really where we constantly learn how to learn and how to develop things together. And I think that's really very much what IKEA has done. You go on, you try to do things. It very often doesn't work you, you expect it. And then you, eat, you don't put on your helmet and try to defend yourself. You say, wow, interesting. It doesn't work per perfectly well. What can we learn from this? How can we move on? And then we take step by step. So that's kind of a general note on leadership. But let's go to today's leadership challenges. And as far as I'm concerned, there are two things that is really on the agenda. First of all, the sustainable future. What is it? And why is it not optional? And the second is when we start to understand that for real, the question is how can we transform society and ourselves and organizations to this agenda? And of course, sustainability is about climate and it's about biodiversity, it's about poverty, and they are all interconnected. But the key thing for me is really the why question. We need to take the why sustainability down into our stomach. If it still stays in a slip service, it won't be enough. One is when you're coming from an organization called the Natural Step in Sweden, where we have tried to make a systems view on planet Earth. And if you see planet Earth as a system, first of all, when it comes to materia, molecules, it's the same molecules we turn around over these 4 billion years. Nothing disappears. The only thing that grows in this system is the photosynthesis, the green cell. And the only thing that comes into planet Earth as a system is energy from the sun, an enormous amount. 
So the question is, how do we capture it and how we store it? And if you accept this description of our planet Earth as a system, it's obvious that the ecosystem is the mother company and the economy is the daughter company. It's not the other way around. And the second picture, of course, this beautiful picture on planet Earth, the blue planet Earth, where we see that we are on a spaceship, you know, traveling for 4 billion years out in the universe somehow. And on this spaceship, just 100 years ago, we were 2 billion people. Now we are 7 and soon to become 10. So it's obvious that we have to rethink how we use our renewable and non-renewable resources on this spaceship. So all this leads us to accept that we need a new way of thinking to solve the cost, the problems caused by the old way of thinking, you know, the classical Einstein quote. And I think the new way of thinking comes a lot from inspiration from nature itself. Nature is a wonderful system. It's truly circular. The word waste hasn't been invented in, your, in nature, but the industrial system we have built for the last 150 years is a very linear take, make, and waste system. So we have to go from the linear thinking to the circular. We have to go from conquering nature to somehow try to live in harmony with nature. So if you then start to look around in the world, what are these intentions turning into, into actions? Well, on the political side, over the last five years, I must say, a lot has happened. You know, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, signed 2015 by all states of and head of states. That's a powerful and extremely important process that's behind that. And of course, then the uh, uh, climate meeting in Paris 2005, they were also all state, head of states really, and we all research is backing it up. It's not legally binding, but it's an extremely important message. And today, I must say, most big companies in the world, they are trying to be part of the solution. If you take Unilever and Paul Pullman as an example, for the extremely important work to try to reduce their footprint uh, tremendously by saying we cannot do healthy business in an unhealthy society. So we have all to, to, to chip into that. And of course, my old company, IKEA, has worked for 25 years to try to be planet positive or people positive, and now trying to build it into the business model. That is to help people to be able to live a sustainable life you know, without having uh, big wallets because the IKEA strategy has also been about providing products of good quality, good design and good function at prices so low that the many people can afford it. Why should only the rich people be able to live a sustainable life? So that's now what the challenge is for IKEA. On the academic side, you also see how things are happening right now. And I like the quote from 2011 where Michael Porter in Harvard Business Review wrote the article of creating shared value where he stated that we need a more sophisticated form of capitalism where we have a social purpose. And now the key, not out of charity, but of a deeper understanding of the competition and of economic value creation. So having said that, politi political side is moving, the business side is moving, academic side is moving. I must say that sustainability today has become more than an ethical imperative for coming generations, it always will be. But it's now also a decisive business imperative because if you see countries or regions or cities or companies, they don't see this challenge, they will be left behind. Because sustainability today as a business case is becoming so obvious. First of all, you have to do it to reduce your risk or being standing with stranded assets, you know, sitting with coal and all that, that is very costly. And secondly, to build a brand where you can attract talented customers or talented co-workers or even attract capital today, you have to show that you are on the solution side. But thirdly, and maybe most important, by taking on the sustainability agenda, you push yourself to be innovative. You need to innovate because we are all now standing just in the beginning of a new era where we need new products, new processes, new business models, new collaborations, we need new education, and we need really a new way of thinking. So that's where we are. And you might say this sounds good, it's moving now, but we're sitting with a big dilemma. And that is, on the one hand, we know that it's far from where we like to be. And if I quote Al Gore from some 10, 15 years ago, when he said, 20, 30 years from now, our children and grandchildren, we say, what were you thinking? 
Didn't you see the glaciers melting? Or didn't you see the, the droughts deepening? Didn't you pay attention? Didn't you care? What were you thinking? And this is still as true when you can say Greta from Sweden, she represents that already now, and it will happen. But at the same time, we, I can quote his friend, uh, President Bill Clinton, who I worked with uh, some 10 years ago when he in a dinner said, I was struck by the countries that won't meet the Kyoto target. You know, 170 countries signed the Kyoto, but only 10 of them delivered. They are not corrupt and they are working and trying to do their best. Uh, but the problem is that they are working in an economy that is not organized for tomorrow's energy. It's organized for yesterday's energy. So even if we start to understand, we get, have to get out of the fossil. We are still in it. It's in our balance sheets. It's in our infrastructure. It's there. And it's naive to think that we can just jump out of that. And that brings us to that dilemma. And it brings us to the question of transformational change. And I think that's it's a bigger one and it's extremely interesting because we have problems not only with business and environment, we have problems with our healthcare systems and our educational system. And I think we, we, we have to see it that change really is not so much about reorganizing and restructuring and re-engineering, rather mechanical words and approaches. No, change comes from reconceiving. When we can help people see something different, something new, because people basically don't mind change, but they mind being changed. And that's why co-creation is so important. We have to do it together. So we feel that we are on the, on the co-working uh, journey. And again, people are not really med, led by managers, according to me, they are led by good ideas. That's why I started. We need to invite people with ideas that are relevant to our times, that are inspirational, <laughs> uh, that people like to be part of because we need a culture in any small company or big one. It has to be a corporate or organizational culture that is trustworthy in relation to what we do. Peter Drucke said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It's a wonderful statement. And that always brings me back to the why question. Why do we want to commit now to a sustainable agenda? That's the key. Uh, finally, uh, I always tend to get the question if I'm an optimistic or a pessimistic view on these issues. Well, I can tell you I'm a very much an optimist and entrepreneur and the most things I believe in. But on the climate agenda, uh, I'm rather careful because it's a giant challenge and it's a lot of inertia and self-interest, but we have to stay hopeful. And I make a very important distinction. And when I refill my hope, I go back to the industrial revolution, you know, 150 years ago, that was a true transformation of our society. But remember, there was no plan, there was no starting point, there was nobody leading the industrial revolution. How did it happen? Yes, it happened from a product of million small beginnings, a process of making things better, an outpouring of human creativity, when people started to see something else that they wanted. And, it, and I think that's hopeful because then all of us can be part of the million small beginnings. If I take my ethanol car, if I need a car in Sweden or little Sweden or all these little things, I think that's the model because the alternative to that model is to expect a new Churchill or somebody to come with a big plan. It won't happen. So we have to trust in the million small beginnings. And secondly, we don't have to go back 150 years. If you take the, idea, the example of smoking in public spaces, if anybody would ask me in early 80s when I lived in France that we would make a plan to forbid smoking in French restaurants, no way. But now it has happened. Why? Science came and told us this is dangerous. Second, people in American TVs, doctors were smoking and saying, no problem, no problem, paid by the industry, of course. But thirdly, some people started to say, I think I'm not going to let people smoke in my restaurants. And then people say, well, you will go bankrupt. Maybe some did, but most of them did not. And when 10, 15 or 15, 20% had changed, the rest follows. So there are social tipping points. So we don't need a plan for everybody to go at the same time. I think that's hopeful. But the key here, we have to show what we want to do as being desirable. It has to be desirable to create this future. Remember, Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have a nightmare. And 
that says something extremely important for us, that we have to create something we want to create. We can't go into this to solve problems. This is a fundamental thing. And another notion on optimism and hope, you might remember Václav Havel. He was in opposition to the Soviet regime in the 60s. He became the later the Czech Republican president. Um, he was of course in opposition and he was thrown into Yale many times. And I think third time in Yale, he was asked of course, can you still be optimistic after all these years and now you're back in Yale? And he wrote the letter on this question to his wife from prison that has become classical where he said, optimist, my dear wife. That's an expectation based on the evidence at hand that there's a reasonable likelihood of a positive outcome. A wonderful description of what ex of optimism is. That is an expectation of an extrapolation. Will this work or not? But then he went on by saying, but hope, my dear wife, that's something completely different. Hope is the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it might turn out. We don't start with the question, will it work or not? We start with, is this important for us to engage in? Is this what we really want to do? Will it work or not? Well, we'll see. That depends how successful we are. I think this is extremely important. And it's also very inspirational, I think, in this uh, agenda that we are talking about. So we have to stay hopeful, but we also have to stay humble because we are working with extremely complicated systems with a lot of unintended consequences. But basically, this is about liberating human creativity. And how do we do that? Well, we need a meaningful cause to believe in. And my dear, my friends here, what can be more meaningful than somehow taking on a, a challenge of creating a desirable, sustainable future? So excuse me for this very speedy now, uh, introduction, but hopefully you have been been happy to follow it. And thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much, Goran. Uh, some fascinating insights there, and plenty to to think about and to talk about and discuss. I suppose uh, one of the things that strikes me, uh, you, you made the point that there has to be a starting point for this, and the starting point is why sustainability, and in that context, it must be something that is desirable. When you look around at the business world and business leaders, whether they're large organizations, small organizations, have they reached the point where they see it as desirable or is there still a lot more work to be done there? Oh, a lot more work, I think. But what I'm trying to say, I think really the why question for me, you know, has to go down into stomach. And for some, maybe the why is still we have to do it because now customers expect it. It's kind of an outside pressure. For some, the why is so deep that it's just obvious that, as I said, we have to see the ecosystem as the mother company and the economy as the daughter company. It's a completely redefinition, I think, on, on the worldview. But it doesn't matter. You need a why to go into this that is very convincing because I think particularly if you see an organization, that why has to come from the top, you know. If now we're seeing here in front of us uh, SMEs, you know, it's about the owner himself or the, v, the CEO that has somehow to show his commitment to why we have to do this. And then sort of say, when you have made that clear commitment, you know, which you constantly have to do over and over again, then you have to go into the next level. And that is, of course, you have to set up some, some footprints uh, uh, statements and you have to see where you are yourself and your company. And there are many ways of doing that today. You know, you can get uh, app, mobile apps or you can have consultants or I'm sure that here the bank will help organizations to some set, set up a basic footprint. And then thirdly, you have them to open up, invite your coworkers, your supply chain, maybe your local community to collaborate on this agenda. So again, Richard, back to your question, the why. Yes, it has to be a strong why. But exactly where it sits, I think that depends very much uh, on, on different organizations and different people. And in the dichotomy between the short term and the long term, these are obviously very desirable, very necessary long term goals. Many business people will feel that doing things differently in a more sustainable way in the short term might cost more. 
So therefore, there might be short-term pain for that long-term gain. Does that necessarily have to be the case? Well, it doesn't have to, but I think it's a good point of departure. But I like to expand it and say, of course, we need to also be able to deliver short-term results because I said, no margin, no mission. When we are leaders, if you can't somehow deliver on results, we won't be around. But you can turn it around and say, how can you create a, a good margin if you don't have a meaningful mission to work with? So I think mission and margin, long-term and short-term, they go hand in hand. It's the same body. It's like when we're out skiing out here, cross country, it's long-term, it's short-term, it's margin, it's mission, but it's the same body. So we have to stay out of the conflict between the two, but of course it's a reality. But in my experience, and I think today, there's so much research coming from everywhere that when you really engage in a sustainability agenda on climate, you tend to have a very good business proposition and you, may, you, might, you tend to be bad doing better results. And for me, basically, I think it comes out of, then you can invite people to create the type of energy you know, that you need Tuesday mornings in any organization to, to see the meaning. So that's why I believe so much in this. We're talking there, Cathy, about um, different cultures and organizations. And yeah. from an AIB point of view, the customers that you're dealing with, um, let's say, for example, I have a business, we're not producing uh, a product that is automatically tapping into sustainability. We're doing it, something that's quite traditional. Mm. We don't feel we have a particularly a plan uh, around sustainability, but we'd like to have one. Yeah. Um, how, how do customers begin that journey? Let's say from a point of view of even talking to yourselves. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Goran, thank you for your, for your thoughts. They've been fantastic. Uh, There's a lot, a lot to, to, to latch on to there. You know, there's short term things that every company can do, um, even if they're, as you say, producing quite a traditional product. It's, you know, around the edges of how they go about that production. There are many short, you know, small things that the companies can do. And I think, you know, that journey has certainly started. There, there might be a tendency to say, but we produce boilers and that's just the way they are. But it gets back to this ingenuity. And we've, I think we have a customer uh, who's going to come on later on who, who has transformed their thoughts about how, what, what it is they produce and how they produce it. Um, it's standing back and saying, well, does it have to be made out of this material? Have we tried other options? And invariably, there are some other options. Um, I heard a, few, a couple of years ago uh, the, uh, the people in Lego talk about their product, which is obviously made of plastic, and they have gone on a journey to come up with a much more sustainable version of that, even though they never really envisaged that that was possible. So it, it comes down to, and I, and I love the, the phrase human energy, um, because that is an unbelievable unlocker of potential, I think. And we, we're seeing it in, in, in AIB that the more we sort of talk about this agenda and look at it ourselves, the more, I, I, talk, I talk about infectious enthusiasm, but infectious enthusiasm gets you new ideas um, and, and uh, it, it helps to uh, kind of mushroom positively. Um, and it's interesting, um, Goran, as well, you, you gave the example of the Industrial Revolution and you said that um, ultimately there was no one person or one group leading that. But the, the Industrial Revolution belonged to the engineers, it belonged to the inventors. What is trying to be achieved now around sustainability, doing things differently, has a huge role for the engineers and the inventors. But surely it's about changing mindsets that people have to be a bit more imaginative, not just the engineering bit. And, and let me say that I love very much what you said here, that. That's why the why question, once you start, and I've seen so many examples of that, when you really start to accept, we have now to find a new trajectory, you know, go a new way. Then you start looking for solutions. Sometimes you find them rather easily, sometimes you don't, but then you have to create them. And what can happen when you take on that journey, it's amazing. And of course, it's engineers, you can say, in terms of product engineering and innovation, but it's more than that. You know, it's on business models and in how the relationships are established. And in it's, of course, how we think ourselves as consumers and customers and parents. So it goes all through society here that it's about the, the new mental models and say new mindsets. And, and I really I think that, and I'm so convinced that if you don't accept the why, then we continue to think that doing talking refrigerators is the solution if you see what I mean. But when you accept, you need to find a new one. 
there's an unbelievable creativity that is unleashed. And, and I think we have to believe in that and hope for it and just be part of it. From a uh, Cathy, from a banking point of view, how important is it that SMEs have uh, a sustainability uh, strategy? Well, look, I think it depends on what sector they're in today. Um, if I look forward a few years, I think it's really vital that everybody has it. Um, it it's very important for certain sectors today. Um, it's very hard to see that it's not going to be a key agenda item as every six months go by. And what we're seeing in the last 12 months is an acceleration that we didn't expect. Um, you know, we've got the, the whole investment community who are now really looking to say, you know, where is, where is your lending going, AIB? Is it going towards more sustainable objectives? Um, and uh, that's gaining force quite rapidly. So I think it is important that everybody stands back and thinks about this. Uh, for some businesses, maybe they don't need to come up with a solution today but they need to be thinking about it. Uh, and and there's a glide path to a lot of this stuff. So, you know. How important then is it for yourselves as an organization that you're all over s sustainability in, in how you do things as well? How important yeah. is that, that that's, that's a space that you feel you're comfortable in and you own? Yeah, it is very important. I, I, I'd hope that we come at it, uh, Gorn, from, the, from the, you know, the principle of this is the right thing to do. Um, but in case we might have forgotten any of that, we, we do have other stakeholders who are very interested, so as our shareholders are interested, uh, and our government shareholder is interested, and our regulator as a, a key stakeholder is also interested, um, because obviously climate has a risk associated to it as well that we all need to sort of address uh, over the coming years. So, you know, I, I, I you know, honestly feel we're, we are coming at it ourselves without outside pressure, but of course there, there is the external environment as well. Mm -hmm. Goran, um, not that long ago, it was during the period when Donald Trump was still president of the United States, I interviewed Paul Pullman, who you mentioned formerly of Unilever. And I said to him, the fact that the Trump administration had pulled out of the Paris Agreement, how would that affect uh, corporations and business and society in America, let's say, and their attitude towards climate change and sustainability? And he said that despite having pulled out of the agreement, the United States was ahead of its Paris Agreement targets because of the contribution that business and individual states in the United States, as opposed to the federal government, the achievements that they had made. And it surprised me that perhaps there, there is an awful lot more being achieved and going on here than we might sometimes realize. Sure. Well, you know, when, we, when I was leading the Clinton Climate Initiative back in 2007, 2008, we had the biggest cities in the world engaged in this. And we also had 100 cities in America. At the time, it was Bush Jr. sitting in Washington. And already that, the Bay mayor said, we can't wait on Washington. You know, this is too important. And that process is on, you know. So, and it's on in America. You, and you see it in cities, in companies. And when you talk about the entrepreneurial, you know, spirit from uh, Tesla and, and, and all this thing, it's just the top of an iceberg. So it's really coming, it's green tech, green technology, and, and it's very venture capital, and it's very entrepreneurial, pro-risk. So that's going on in America. Let me also say that you have another thing in, in the world, and that's China. China has a completely different model, five-year plans, but they're also, it's a tremendous race that is on, on somehow going into the new technologies that are gonna be sustainable. So you have China and you have America, two extremely important uh, different approaches, but it is bubbling there. So there's a lot of things going on. So again, with Trump, I agree completely. He couldn't stop that process. He could do what he did. He pulled out of that. But what happened, it even turned people on even more in different states and in cities and in companies. And as a matter of fact, Michael Bloomberg, who I worked with at the time in C40, I think he, he pitched in money instead of the United States into the Paris Agreement just to show that we can't stop this process. What advice then, Goran, would you have for a small business uh, owner or manager who is very much at the beginning of this process around sustainability? Where, where should they start? What advice would you give them? Well, again, I tried to say that really go into yourself and, and ask yourself whether you think this is something you like to engage. And I would say that you need to engage in, and then you find out why it's so important. You know, it can be on the personal note, 
Some people have just got a new grandchild that says, you know, I start to think long term now, so I need to bring this in, or that you bring in people that present analysis and so forth. So work a little bit on the why question. And then, of course, I invite your, if your team or find your little spot in the million small beginnings. And I think that's a release for me to open up the million small beginnings because it's easily we say, well, what does it mean if I do this? This will not change the world. That's a dangerous thought. We have all of, it, all, all of us to start where we are and see what we can do. And I know when you start that journey, you know, in the beginning, it might be a lot of, let's say, greenwashing because, but it just takes some time and you think, oh, we have to go deeper. We can go further. It brings a new opportunity. And then, so it's a hand in hand process of taking small steps. So just get going. And of course, today you have a lot of help out there. For example, if you like to find your footprint, CO2 footprint, as I said, there are mobile apps you can use or there are consultants or of course there's SNME, you shouldn't pay much money to consultants. But here also the banks, I think are an important uh, uh, partner in just helping to get going. And then the process somehow tend to, to have its own life. Kathy, if, if someone goes to the bank, to AIB, sure. how can you uh, support them as, as they move towards sustainability strategies? Sure. Well, um, first of all, we try and put them in touch with uh, a knowledge base. Um, so we, we, we partnered with Dublin Chamber of Commerce uh, earlier this year, uh, in, in 2020, which brought 80 uh, SME firms in a, in a Dublin context together, learning about this whole initiative. So, so these are some of the things we can do. We can provide some incentives around green products, so that where it, it's a little bit cheaper for your loan if you're if you're investing into a sustainable uh, project. And and we we've done quite a lit uh, a lot in the corporate space actually on sustainability loans. And we have green products for green vehicles and 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 all of that. So so we're certainly that's more tangible type of uh, uh, benefits. Um, and I think just we're trying to educate our relationship managers, as I said, to be partners, that they can just talk through, to, through with companies. Well, you know, what are the opportunities? What are, the, what, are, what, are they, what are we seeing other partners or other customers in the same sector doing? And, you know, you know there's nothing wrong with copying others. Um, so th I think it's all about learning, talking and trying some small things. Um, I agree with Goran, just start, you know, it, it can be a little bit overwhelming, but just get going on it. And Goran, a final question to you, bearing in mind the, the definitions of optimism and hope from Vaclav Havel that you, you quoted, uh, when you look at the evidence around all of this and the future and sustainability, are you optimistic or are you hopeful or are you both? Well, I'm hopeful. Uh, I, as I said, it's, it, it's difficult for me to say that I'm optimistic when I somehow see the challenges ahead in terms of you know all the data and, and all the dependence we have on fossil and you know the timeline we see on on the sea. But again, we have to do the best possible, and that's where I'm hopeful. And again, the over the last just five years, I've been on this now since I left IKEA 20 years ago. You know, because I believe in bringing in business solutions on this agenda, because if you don't bring business in, it will just be dreaming. We need to have business and all the resources. And the acceleration of the last five years is just amazing. And I think that's uh, that's where the hope is. And then it's just keep on working and and, and maybe keep, keep our fingers crossed that uh, that the, the climate isn't that scary that it might be in, in some of the scenarios. Um, well, thank you very much, Goran Karstead and uh, Kathy Bryce of AIB. Thank you very much for, for joining us this morning for that fascinating contribution. I really enjoyed it and I hope you did as well. We're going to take a short break, uh, five minutes, and we'll be back with session two, which is on cooperation, working together for a positive future. And we'll be hearing from some uh, small businesses themselves about the issue of sustainability. So join us then. Thank you. Welcome back uh, to this AIB Business Leaders Live event. We're talking about sustainability uh, among SMEs and we're about to 
kick off our second session. I hope you had a good short break. We had some fairly deep questions uh, for early in the morning in the first session and maybe you've come up with some very deep answers for your organisation, which would be great if you have. But I'm delighted to uh, kick off the second session with a panel discussion and the theme of this session is cooperation working together for a positive future. And we're joined by Brian O'Kennedy, CEO of Clearstream Solutions, Sean Breen, MD of EcoValve, and Anne Butterly, CEO and founder of Easy Dry. So you're all very welcome this morning. Um, if I could start with you, Brian O'Kennedy, Clearstream, just tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and the business and what you do. Yes, good morning, Richard. Um, we set up Clearstream about uh, 13 years ago now, um, and we're an independent consulting firm. Uh, despite what Goran said out there, we, <laughs> we're, we're out there helping uh, companies to measure, report, and disclose their sustainability strategies. Um, and I guess when we started out 13 years ago, um, it was a very different world. It was a very different environment uh, for consultants at that time because nobody understood what sustainability was. So um, it's very different now. Um, it's a very competitive issue. Um, I'd agree with what all the speakers have said to date is that we've seen a massive increase in the number of companies implementing sustainability programs. Um, and uh, yes, as I said, it's become a competitive issue now. Businesses are competing, so it's no longer the the green economy, the, the, the whole economy is, is now uh, becoming green and companies are having to be able to disclose and report their sustainability strategies. So we're delighted to be part of that. We, we've grown our team now up to, to eight people um, and uh, yeah, helping hundreds of companies with their sustainability journeys. Okay, great, thanks, Brian. Uh, Sean Breen, uh, EcoVal, EcoVal, tell us, EcoVal, tell us a little bit about that and was sustainability built into it at the very beginning? Yes, it was in uh, 2008, we started a company called uh, EcoPlant, and that was to provide uh, plant hire for, uh, for the construction companies. Um, and uh, so we focused on electric and battery because we felt there was um, a requirement for machines working in, in, in environments like the pharmaceutical companies in hospitals and so on, where they'd be doing renovations and that. So there was combustion engines in there and it wasn't very pleasant. So. So first of all, in 2008, we started the company and we um, we took the engines out of conventional diggers and we put in electric motors. And from that, then uh, we we had a demand then that was that worked really well. And um, in the first year, we 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 turned over only fifty thousand euros on this. And um, then the customers demanded more and they wanted electric dumper trucks so we decided we searched worldwide for this so there was nothing on the market so we focused in on developing this product and focusing on building a really good quality machine so that not alone would it serve our needs but it could also be um, a machine that we could sell worldwide so we uh, put a lot of focus into the into the quality of the machine and so from that company within 10 years it turned over a seven figure sum just on um, on the plantar side of it so that's uh, running nicely now we have got we added several more uh, machines into that and and we're very happy with the progress of that company so with the ecovolve side of it then um, to date we as we, as as I've already said with a with a we're, we're putting a lot of focus into the into the machine uh, we sold our first one in America in 2015, and today we have shipped over 150 to America. So we're um, we're really doing well on that on that front, and we have uh, shipped about 50 to Europe. So we're planning to uh, expand on that further by uh, developing um, a loader, which we will have next year, early next year, a battery powered electric loader, and we have also developed um, a descale uh, arm for working in cement plants. Which is um, which is also electric and it and it um, eliminates the need for 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 people to be working in such a dangerous environment. So we're very positive about about uh, about our business Great. going well, forward. There was certainly no short term short term pain for long term gain. You seem to have uh, short term gain having started in the whole eco space uh, originally, Sean. Well done on that, and we, we can come back to that again in a moment. But I want to talk to uh, Anne Butterly, CEO and founder of Easy Dry. Again, uh, your product sustainability was was built into the business right at the very beginning. 
Hi, Richard. Uh, yes, uh, when I developed, I developed Easy Dry 15 years ago, and um, we basically manufacture a range of environmental, sustainable textiles and towels, um, particularly for the hairdressing sector, the gym, hotel, and more recently, um, healthcare. Um, and when I developed Easy Dry originally, um, I suppose the key why was to uh, outperform cotton and actually provide a better solution to what was currently on the market. Hairdressers were washing and drying towels constantly and um, machines on nine hours a day, tumble dryers on the same in hotels across the globe. Um, um, and actually, basically, it wasn't a hygienic product. It is a hygienic product, but basically, Easy Dry, I wanted to develop a single use product that was also environmentally friendly. Um, and when I looked into the production of cotton, uh, basically to, to uh, develop and manufacture a cotton towel uses 5,000 to 6,000 litres of water. Whereas when we developed Easy Dry, we use six litres of water to make the towel. And then we don't actually use any water when because you don't need to launder it. Um, so sustainability was at the heart of it, because when you're developing a product that you know is going to be sustain sustainable, in Ireland at the time, 15 years ago, we just introduced the green plastic tax for the plastic bags. Um, there was a backlash coming against disposable products for disposable nappies. And if they were going to landfill, they were going to be there for 15. They were going to be there, sorry, for 30 years plus. So what I wanted for Easy Dry was that I could develop a product that would have a global impact, but that would also um, outperform what was on the market, but be sustainable. And I suppose this brought me back to the key question of how am I going to make this? And actually, how am I going to make this through every aspect of our supply chain? And how are we going to get it out to the customer? And if we get it out to the customer, how are we going to educate them that a, a disposable single-use product is actually better for the environment than what they are currently using? So that was at the heart of how do I develop a product, first of all, sustainably, but then how do I educate the market that it is more sustainable? Because the disposable aspect of it also had people, you know, people couldn't understand it. So for me, you know, I'm sure that we have very, very clear um, points of reference, as in, so we went on the certification route. Um, you're talking about cooperation here and collaboration. Our supply chain is very, very critical to us. And that's where I said we, we looked at how different materials were made. So how do you make cotton? How was a, a microfiber towel made? And then how are we going to make Easy Dry? And partnering from the very, uh, you know, for, we have FSC certification. So basically making sure that all our key partners along our supply chain are also sustainable in as much as possible. But that's the core that we can actually, we can all add value from the start of the supply chain right through to the end. And I'm was it a was it a difficult battle to educate those those customers or potential customers? You said, how are we going to tell them that a single use product is more environmental, is better for the environment than a multi use product? How did you do that? Well, I think that was actually getting the facts. And actually, that's where at the time I set up 15 years ago, if Clearstream had been there, probably would have made my job a lot easier at the start, kind of having somebody that could actually help us tell our impact. But we actually were very, very clear on what we wanted to achieve and get the, the key facts. So again, from uh, working with our core production um, facilities along the way, as in well, what, how much water is used in the production of you know, cotton? How does that compare to what we do? And actually getting the metrics out there. And once you have the metrics, again, then it was following, uh, follow, finding our, you know, our, our early adopters out there. Like, I mean, 15 years ago, sustainability was just at, at the start. So the key message was like, we can actually, you know, outperform what you're currently doing. So that was the key thing because you don't want people, people aren't going to move from what they're currently doing if they're taking a step, step backwards. So we proved on the metrics that we could save a typical salon in Ireland, 60,000 litres of water. We could save them 5,000 euros uh, on the bottom line. We could save them 4,000 kilowatts of energy each year uh, and then 2,000 kilowatts of CO2. Sorry, see 2,000 um, CO2. So we could reduce their CO2 emissions. We could reduce the water. We could reduce their energy consumption. We could reduce their time, the amount of time they had in the salon. And we could actually, you know, improve their bottom line by 5,000. And, and, and that was something very quick. And Brian, um, the, the why question that Goran talked about, uh, Anne has given an answer to it there in her case, because the, the why was quite compelling as to why uh, customers could use this product and what its benefits were. What, the SMEs that you talk to, I would imagine, do they fall into two categories? That there are businesses like the two we have here that are sustainability driven right from the word go, and then there are others that are perhaps 
at a much earlier stage and they're thinking about how can we do our processes in a more sustainable way or do things differently? Yeah, I, I guess everyone's on a journey uh, with this, Richard. So even the most advanced or even the companies that have done significant work are still on a journey. Things are changing, they're dynamic. So I would say, and it came across with a number of the uh, the previous speakers mentioned, really it's about starting um, because you know we're, we find a lot of our clients are a little defensive about where they are, but in reality, when they look at their business, there's lots and lots of things that they're doing that are very good um, and that are, in, in a sense, it can be described as sustainable. Um, and they were very focused on the environmental, but it might be something got to do with workplace. It might have something got to do with the society. So if you look inside your business and say, well, what are we good at? Are we, are we better at any, anything here around the sustainability issue than our peers? Because as I said, it's a competitive issue. And if we want to be competitive, um, we need to understand where, where are we going to provide a better solution than, than our competition for this. So that's why uh, what Anne has described is, yes, having a good, clear message about what it is we're delivering to the customer, where the impacts are, so understand the measures, have a clear plan about where you're going in terms of your direction and engage. I mean, this is a, a team sport. You can't do anything without your supply chain, your upstream, your, your suppliers, nor your customers. And, and they're the people that you should engage with. So, so really, it doesn't really matter at what stage of maturity that you're at. Um, those four basic principles from having a plan, measuring, setting some targets and getting on the, on the road and engaging with your stakeholders that's going, to, that's going to see you through any sustainability strategy. Yeah. And Sean, in, in your case, clearly from the start, from EcoPlant right through, sustainability, being environmentally aware, has been at, at the bread and butter at the heart of your business. What, what advice would you give now to someone who, who is just looking at it and is at a very different place in terms of what they might consider doing differently or doing better from a sustainability point of view? Okay, Richard. Um... Well, the first thing is to, and what really helps me is that I think five years down the road and minimum five and 10 years and where we're going to be in five, five years and 10 years. That's very important because we will have dips in the economy. We'll have other things will, will, will come into it and affect us, such as COVID and that. But if you know in, in five years, things are going to, we're going to be in a different place and in 10 years it's going to be a lot different. So that's very important to be focused on that. And that helps us that we're ahead. We don't have competition. We really don't because we're already planning for five and 10 years ahead. So when we get there, we already have the market built and, uh, and, and that, 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 that helps us. So um, I think that's very important. Um, yeah, so that, that's where I, yeah. Uh, and for you, what advice would you give uh, businesses to, to if they'd want to look at their sustainability model and how they're doing things? I think there would be kind of three aspects. There's one, what you're doing in your business, you know. Um, so if you're producing a product, to look at your full supply chain. And like you're saying, backstream as in, and actually to talk to your suppliers because you may not be aware of some of the supply uh, sustainability initiatives that, that they've gone through that you can actually use to promote in your business also. So if you're using warehousing, if you're using courier companies, they're all looking to be carbon neutral, carbon efficient. So basically talk to them and actually gather that information because it's not only what you're doing in your own business, it's what they're doing that then basically you can build on it and then you tell your customers what your whole stream has done. So then they can, so as a whole, we're actually developing step by step. Um, and then the other side would be look at your own product and service. And again, it's the simple things you can do. So if you're a coffee shop, are you using 100% compostable coffee cups? Have you got your, you know, is the recycling, is your waste management, a green waste management company? So there's simple things for each business. So for instance, we're in the salon sector. So L'Oreal is going to be, you know, go, all their sites are going to be carbon neutral by 2025. Garnier has a, the Green Beauty Initiative by 2025. A lot, um, they're, they're targeting 17 of the SDG uh, goals. So for a salon industry, I'd be saying, look at your suppliers and see what they're doing um, within your own thing. Are they looking at their packaging? They're all doing it. Cow is doing it. Goldwell is doing it. Well is doing it. Vade is doing it. So they're all doing it. So it's actually talk to your industry. It's the same with the hotel sector. There's huge green initiatives with regards water in, in the shower heads, water supply within the each hotel room. So within your own industry sector, it's talk to your industry bodies. 
Uh, and I think if each industry could actually rise up, you know, that's where I'm kind of so. So salmon sector in Ireland could save 180 million litres of water by switching to easy drive. That's just the salmon sector, never mind any other sector. And, so and if you talk different industry sectors and see how they could, how they can all work together to have an impact. And Brian, finally to you, um, it's great that more companies will move in that direction and do that because it moves towards a, a very desirable end goal. But it makes good business sense, and I'd imagine you would advise uh, clients to do it, to let people know that you are doing it as well because that's good for business and it's becoming more important, isn't it? Yeah, it's appearing in, in tenders. Um, all of the big companies now are looking into their supply chains because, as Anne has said, they are setting targets to reduce their own emissions. And if you're supplying one of these large companies, you are in their emissions. So you are part of their supply chain. You are part of their scope three emissions. So they will be looking for you to reduce their supply chain emissions. So that competitive opportunity is there to do what Anne is doing and going telling them what, what Anne and Sean are doing and telling them how you can help them to reduce their emissions. And there's lots of help out there now, Enterprise Ireland, um, uh, the, uh, the Leos have, have green micro funding um, and uh, vouchers to start the journey. It's, it's free of charge. You can get two days of consulting. You can get help from the chambers, Dublin Chamber, uh, as, as uh, was Cathy mentioned earlier. There's training being delivered through the Dublin Chamber of Commerce. Uh, free of charge uh, and a minimal fee. So the, the cost issue, it, it's, it's minimal compared to the upside that's there and the ability to attract new business. Consumers are spending uh, up to seven times more on products that have a sustainable brand uh, than they traditionally did in the food sector. So lots and lots of opportunities. Okay. We'll have to leave it there. Brian O'Kennedy, Sean Breen and Anne Butterley, thank you very much for joining us this morning. And we'll be back with, uh, we'll be back with session three. After this five-minute break, we'll be talking about uh, consumer trends with a particular focus on sustainability. So join us then. Thank you. You're very welcome back to the third session of this AIB Business Leaders Live event where we're talking about sustainability for SMEs. And this session we will have a panel discussion and I'm delighted to be joined here in studio by Catherine Moroni, who's Head of Business Banking Market at AIB. And we're also joined on the link by Patrick Buckley, MD of EPS, and Niall Fay, Director of Grant Engineering. You're all very welcome. And we're going to talk a bit about business and consumer trends uh, with a particular focus on sustainability. What are you seeing, Catherine, in the bank when you, when you talk to customers about trends that are out there? Hi, Richard, and thanks. And thanks for joining us. There are a number of trends. I, I think one of the most prevalent or obvious ones is how sustainability has moved out of the domain of the very large businesses, the multinationals, the heavy carbon footprint businesses, power generation, and it's moving into mainstream, and it's moving into mainstream in the operating models. So for example, when we set up our climate action and infrastructure team over five years ago, they were involved in very large ticket deals. There were multiple banks involved because the risks were higher. Some of it was being tested at the time, and there were very large deals. What has happened now at pace is that first of all, the technologies are understood, the payback times are understood. So that part of it is well understood. And that has meant that sustainability in the operating model has moved into all sectors and all sizes of businesses. So now what we're seeing is businesses in the hotel sector, retail, food, agri, they are all moving into making sure their operating models are sustainable. And they're at different stages, obviously, of their journey, but it has very much become part of business as usual. So that's one big trend. The other big piece that has really happened already is, if you go back a number of years, you would have found that sustainability was really part of a CSR unit in a big organization. And the emphasis would have been more on the sustainability 
piece um, in terms of sponsorship, which is an important part. We, we speak a lot about the environment, but the societal impact of diversity, inclusion, is also important. So it is a part of it, and it's an important part. But sustainability as a business imperative has moved out of that CSR office and into the mainstream. So it's affecting operating models. And all size businesses are investing for energy, heat, light, waste, the circular economy. So that's another very big trend. The other thing as a result of the regulation, I think, in the main, and that's both at international level, you know, UN goals, the EU taxonomy, and our own government bringing that into our own policies. What we're finding there is that's, that's driving the business with more pace as well, because businesses want to be in ahead of that. And they don't want to find themselves at a wall where they have to change at, at speed because they've left it too late. So the change is quite incremental. Uh, it is entering into financing as well, because the technology is proven. I mean, we're, we're really active in all aspects of this, be it solar, light, heat, and it's, we understand it, we understand the payback period, so it's relatively straightforward to finance now, as opposed to, say, five years ago. And then I think another thing that is really going to start to impact businesses in their operating model is because of that regulatory change and because big businesses looking at their scope one, two, and three, green procurement and being asked for your credentials when you're tendering is becoming part of the tendering process. And that's going to be really important because there will be a period where you can transition into that, but it will get to a stage positively where businesses who've already been on that journey are going to be able to be more competitive because that small box on a tender is becoming a bigger box and it's becoming more important. And then, of course, COVID has helped the acceleration in digital, which has positive aspects too in terms of footprint. And the, the, the other thing is people, planet, profit isn't just about the planet, so the whole people practices and the societal impact and value are all sure. parts that, that are starting to change as well. Okay. So there's a lot, a lot going on, a lot of change still happening. Uh, Patrick Buckley, MD of EPS, just tell us a bit about yourself and, and about the business and the kind of changes that you're seeing in, in, in trends that are taking place. Morning, Richard, and morning to all your listeners. Yeah, um, EPS, we're 53 years on the go this year. Um, we're predominantly involved in water and wastewater and pumping, the provision of resources across the UK and Ireland, um, Northern Europe, with some projects in the Middle East and, and, and Africa, and then some one-off projects for certain customers on a global scale as well. Um, obviously, we're in the water space, so we protect the environment. So sustainability for us has been, has been core to what we do from many years you know since our since our startup um but sustainability for us means a lot more than just you know the environment aspect which is very important it's also about our people you know how we look after our people how we treat them um ensuring that they excel how we operate and work with the communities that we're involved in because obviously we, we build infrastructure so there's a potential impact there when we're actively constructing a water or wastewater treatment plant so does that impact in terms of how we deal with our communities and interact with them? And then the positive benefits after when you've provided the, the infrastructure, you're protecting the waterways and the environment. But then like, we're also focused on lean, continuous improvement uh, and the health and safety and well-being of all of our, of our people. The, the other big one for us on sustainability in terms of the trends in particular, um, we see it as it's hugely important for our brand, you know, building social capital for EPS as a business, you know, being a business that and being a team that people can trust, you know, and we have to balance a lot of a lot of expectations in there in terms of various stakeholders, ensuring we have, you know, that that honesty, that transparency that drives the trust. And, and you know, 80 percent of our business is business to business. So we deal with water and power utilities. We deal with, with you know, industrial customers, commercial customers. But 20 percent in is direct to end users and, and homeowners and individual consumers. So you have different trends. You know, the, the larger uh, utilities are obviously all very focused on, you know, their sustainability strategies, net zero. Um, you know, carbon reduction. So they just to even play in the game there, just to get tendered, you must be measuring carbon. You know, there's a whole set of KPIs you need to meet just to get in. Um, and then on the other side, homeowners that are buying products like pumps or water treatment units for their homes or their apartments, 
over the last eight to 10 years, and it has been accelerating at pace in particular in the last two years. They're very focused now and very conscious and much more aware and educated on the products that they're buying and very focused on ensuring they buy products that are that are sustainable. You know, so I, I, and Goran is very right earlier in his in his, you know, when he talks about the why, you know, and, and the why for EPS in particular goes right back to our purpose and our why as a business. You know, we safely deliver sustainable water and wastewater solutions globally, you know, for our customers and their communities and benefits their communities and their stakeholders. But we also need to promote that, you know, and foster the highest of ethical standards and integrity when we do that. Um, and so for us, that is sustainability in every part of our business. It spans our full supply chain right across all our activities, all our business units, every one of our activities. Sustainability is wrapped all over it. Okay. And um, we can come back to some of that in a moment. Niall Fay, Director of Grant Engineering, tell us a bit about uh, the business and what you're seeing in relation to sustainability. Yep. Morning, Richard. Um, Grant is uh, headquartered in Boron County Offaly, where we employ over 400 people in Ireland, the UK and France. Um, our primary business is in the residential heating sector. Um, and we supply both renewable technologies and we supply uh, fossil based uh, heating appliances such as condensing oil boilers. What we're probably seeing in the residential home market is in particular around new build where we're seeing the installation of heat pumps, which is the uh, preferred option in a new build and uh, in the retrofit area it's a lot more difficult and uh, where we continually see fossil fuel boilers um, condensing oil boilers being installed. Over the last three years, our R&D team in, in Grant have been working at developing a boiler that is biofuel friendly. And uh, we have currently launched uh, a biofuel compatible boiler now into the market, and it uses a biofuel called HVO. Um, and the, the, the size of that is that the home heating market for oil boilers currently is 680,000 homes in Ireland approximately. So if you move to 100% biofuel, you would be looking up at a 30% carbon saving for all residential heat um, in the Irish market. Um, now, obviously, that's probably not going to happen overnight, um, but we do see it that over time, you could have a 10% blend, a 20% blend, a 30% blend of biofuel, bringing it up to 100%. Um, and I suppose we see it as society demands it. Um, we, we look at the sustainability of our products um, and that's one area that we're, we're looking at sustainability. And the other area is actually the, our footprint and um, how we actually manufacture our products and deliver those products to the market and what is the environmental impacts. And I suppose from our point of view, um, we kind of would look at the very, from a practical point of view and functional view that there, there must be substance behind that. And two of the th areas that we have as a business focused on was the introduction of ISO 14001, which is an environmental standard which man manages and controls our activities and um, that have an environmental impact. And then another ISO international standard that we have uh, implemented into the business is ISO 50001, which is an energy management system. And those two have been key drivers for uh, sustainability within our manufacturing processes and how we, how we have developed the business. Thanks, um, thanks, Niall. Catherine, it's interesting, you know, we talk about customer changes, customers themselves, consumers in many ways, driving a lot of the change that, that's taking place and needs to take place. From an AIB point of view, um, what kind of supports does AIB have for, for businesses that want to go down this road? Okay, specifically in sustainability. Um, yeah, I, and I, I, it was great to hear Pat talk about their why. I mean, we're a service business, so our why, our, our role, is to help our customers, business and consumer to achieve their dreams and ambitions. So we're a facilitator. We, we, we amplify the impact. So where we're, we're highly active in the sustainability space. We're financing it for several years now. And there's a number of ways that we help our customers. Maybe I might just start with the consumer. So we're already very active yes. in the mortgage and the electric vehicles. And we, you know, we can finance both new bills and we can finance retrofits. So that was mentioned by Niall there. So that's sort of the consumer side. I know this is very focused on business, but no harm to say that. And we're, we have a social housing fund uh, with 300 million that's, that's building social and affordable housing. We're in the full value chain there, supporting the build and the purchase. And then in the business side, the, I mentioned earlier how the technology is 
is, is well understood now. So when a business decides they want to, they very often start in the energy space because that's where they can make an awful lot of their savings in the initial stages. So whether it's solar, you know, the standard or biomass, we're, we're in all of those and we can asset finance those. And I think a really important thing to say to businesses about that is they very often look at the capex cost and they're saying to themselves, how can I afford that in my business? But actually, an awful lot of the capex outlay makes huge operational savings then in the business. Both Pat and I'll sort of refer to that. And therefore, they can see an immediate impact on their EBITDA, which is, is very EBITDA enhancing. So that's really helpful. So we're in that whole value chain in the finance side. But I think another piece, it was, it was mentioned there is the societal impact. There are some businesses that haven't necessarily gone very far down this journey yet. So when I speak of finance, that's a business that has already decided what they want to do and how they're going to do it. But if you're back at the stage where you're saying, where do I start in this journey? And Brian mentioned this earlier. There are lots of supports and partnerships that we're involved in. And that's, that's another trend actually in this is collaboration and working together in a very open way very like the open economy, really. So there's the DCU piece. Um, you know, we're, we're involved with a number of universities. We're in UCC in a sustainable leadership piece with them. We're in DCU helping sustainable families. Um, we're, we're in Trinity. So we're in the colleges if we start with the education piece. And then we move up into what we're doing with membership and trade bodies. Uh, the Dublin Chamber was mentioned several times. There's just one thing I might add to that, which is... That's not just for members, it's for non-members, and it's a modular training. So if you're at the early stage, you can start with Sustainability 101. You can start with what does it mean, where would it impact me in my business and my carbon footprint. And without going through all of them, we've, we've partnerships in every sector. We're partnered with Chagas for Agri, we're partnered with Education, we're partnered with Manufacturing. So the best thing to do is talk to us. We've, like, we've 12 fully qualified BAGs whose sole job is to ad, um, advise the agri-sector. And that's mirrored in, in sectors in, in, in our business. So uh, the, the most important thing, I think, is to talk to us and then we, we can help, sure. is Great. the key, key high-level message. Uh, absolutely. And um, Patrick, obviously your business, you know, it's very much at the heart of the business sustainability. You look at the sector you're in, you've already looked at how you do things. So you've come a long way in sustainability. But if you were to project down the road, what, what does the future of your sector and your business look like? What, what do you want it to look like? Yeah, very good question, Richard. Like, I suppose ultimately the, the true measure of how sustainable we are as a business will be, will, be, will be judged in 10, 20, 50 years from now. You know, we hopefully will still be here as a business, you know, we'll be hopefully industry leading. Um, and most importantly is the legacy we leave as a business, you know, and as, as the leaders and as the, the current team, we're very fortunate, the group of us that are there today, to have the, you know, to have that task and responsibility of, of leading a brilliant team of over 533 people now. Um, you know, the business is 53 years this year, you know, the legacy of the first 53 years is already set, it's on the canvas, it's printed, it's done, you know, um, the next 50, is within our grasp and within, you know, it's within our control to, to make decisions that actually paint that canvas and you know, what it will look like down the road is ultimately up to how we, how we engage with the sustainability agenda and really, I suppose, get involved, lead, do what we can right across all the various areas of focus that are required as a business to drive and, and if you had if you had, Patrick, one piece of advice for an SME out there, about that's looking at sustainability, improving what they're doing around sustainability. What 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 would you say to them? Yeah, well, like, like imagine you're sitting in 2030, and irrespective of what business you're in, you know. And I have to accept some business have been very fortunate in the last 12 months with the pandemic. They've had business; others have not. You know, not of their making. It's just it's happened and un unavoidable. But you know, what will your business look like in 2030? What do you look like as an individual leader or as a management team? And you're, either, you're only going to be sitting in three boxes. There, there is a fourth. That means you don't exist. But, you know, the three boxes are you're going to be sitting in 2030 and you're a dinosaur living in the 2020s. Um, you're going to be in that middle middle zone where you're doing OK. You're, you're not really standing out. You're not exceptional, but you're not very bad, but you're doing OK. 
or you're going to be a business that's going to really stand out. You're out in front and you're leading and you are successful as a result, you know, and, and I suppose the steps that businesses take and the leadership teams in those businesses take today, this year and next year is going to set your agenda for 2030. And generally, most businesses, whatever you look like in 2030, that's generally where you're going to be in 2040. So okay. it's now you need to start making these decisions. And there's loads of government supports for people to start the journey. Some companies may already be on the journey. And if you are, you need to start accelerating the pace, you know, and, and pick up a bit and start making some more strategic decisions and, 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 and making decisions that actually make, make a difference. Okay. And Niall Fay again, the future of, of your sector, your business, what, what does that look like for you? What do you want it to look like? Yeah, I think we will we will move to significant uh, or substantial decarbonisation. I know the ambitions are quite high, but I do believe we will move to there as a society and as industry. Um, I take, for example, the, your first speaker where he mentioned the smoking and smoking ban, where we were then and where we are now. So I do think that decarbonisation within the sector is going to happen. Um, and I think it will happen within the next 20, 30 years without, without a doubt. Um, and I think industry has a vital role to play in that, uh, using all technologies, uh, whether it's biofuel, biomass, uh, solar or uh, wind or, or hydrogen, whichever is going to come to the fore for consumers. Um, and I would say as regards for, you know, people going on their journey of sustainability, I would say, again, like your first speaker, start in little steps, you know, depending on the size of the organisation and obviously engagements with the Leos and with the Enterprise Ireland. Um, but you know, you, you can start from looking at your own lighting, your 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 um, compressors, your heating, your um, water, your uh, waste recycling, um, and even even a small thing. There's the Triple E register, which is run by the SEI, which lists uh, an energy efficient product database. Um, and any of those products that you purchase, there uh, you receive an accelerated capital allowance on them. Um, so there's an incentive both from a tax point of view and an environmental point of view and a productivity view because most of them are highly productive. Okay, that's great. Well, we uh, we had a poll there running, and we asked the question: Is the area of sustainability important to your business growth and gaining competitive advantage? And yes, was the answer to from 92.3%, no, 7.7%. So I think it reflects uh, the level of awareness among our audience today of how important all of this is. And, and to a certain extent, maybe many of them have already begun to, to move down that, that journey. Catherine, I suppose a, a final question to you. What sort of advice would you have for, for an SME that, that wants to progress their sustainability agenda and strategy? I, I would say the most important thing is to just get into it and, and start to look at this area without repeating what has already been said by both Pat and Niall. There, there's, a, there's a very proven track here, even though it feels new. So when they, you know, they, they can talk to us, they can talk to all of the government organisations, their trade bodies and member organisations are already also providing supports here. So depending on where they're, if they're at the learning stage, whatever sector they're in, there are supports for their sector and there are government supports for their sector. The, the, they don't really have to worry about the efficacy of the technology. I mean, obviously they have to pick the right one, but, but they're proven and they have supports there to help them with that. And the great thing about the journey is that once they're on that journey, the payback times, because business sustainability is also about the profit piece in the people, planet, profit. So it's understandable if they want to be here in the 2040, the fantastic 2040 uh, described by Pat there, that it has to be sustainable for them. So they can start there. But I'd also add to that, that there, there's the whole people side as well. And there's been so much change there that that's a piece they need to bring their teams with them. And we talked about the co-creation earlier. So there's a wonderful opportunity for the entire team in a business to get involved in the change. So the first thing I'd say is if you're not on the journey, start. There's huge supports out there now. There's proven technology. And we're also very familiar with all of that now and very familiar with financing it and providing the supports and the expertise around that. So, okay. so talk to your partners would be my number one recommendation. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, uh, for that. And of course, I, I, I'm reminded of Goran's point of asking yourself why as well at the very beginning. Why sustainability? Why do it? Because that will influence and shape 
what you do and how you do it as well. But thank you very much to Catherine Moroni, to Patrick Buckley and to Niall Fay. And thanks to uh, all of our guests and participants here at this sustainability event this morning, AIB Business Leaders Live event. And I hope you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. I've got an awful lot from it. Plenty of food for thought. So uh, you have a journey, of, a journey ahead of you. So uh, get moving on it, I think is probably the message. But there's lots of help out there to help you with that. But thank you very much for joining us. Until the next time. Bye-bye.